Hello and welcome to Lettres d'Amérique, a virtual series featuring essential American literary voices. I'm Alice McCrum, Programs Manager at the American Library in Paris. Bonjour et bienvenue à Lettres d'Amérique, une série virtuelle avec les nouvelles voix de la littérature américaine. Je suis Alice McCrum, responsable des programmes à la Bibliothèque Américaine de Paris. Tonight I have the pleasure of hosting Eulabis in conversation with Yara Jalsi to discuss Jalsi's latest novel, Transcendent Kingdom. Here it is in the French copy, uh, Sublime Royaume. Uh, so now I will introduce uh, Eula and Yara, and then they will begin their conversation. The author of four books, Eulabis holds an MFA in nonfiction writing, um, from the University of Iowa and has been teaching at Northwestern University for 15 years. Her work has been translated in, into over 10 languages and has been recognized by a Guggenheim Fellowship, among other prizes. Her essays and poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The Guardian, Harper's and The New York Times Magazine, among others. This, who we are welcoming back, albeit virtually uh, this evening, is a former fellow at the American Library in Paris. Uh, Yula will be in conversation with Yara Jassi, who was born in Ghana and raised in Alabama. Her first novel, Homegoing, received critical acclaim in the US and the national, and around the world, in fact, <laughs> and the National Book Foundation named Jassi to its annual list of the five most outstanding young authors. Jassi holds a BA in English from Stanford University and an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Uh, so now over to Yula. And Yar, thank you so much to both of you for joining us at Lettres de Marie this evening. We are absolutely delighted to have you. And as we were saying just before the call, this is truly just the first part of an ongoing conversation that will happen at the library in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you to the American Library in Paris for hosting this. Yeah, I am so delighted to be in conversation with you about this very lovely novel. This is the US edition, Transcendent Kingdom, beautiful. Um, so I was very interested. I, I wanted to start with this bit of information that I learned from the back of the book, which is that this novel was based on or expanded from a short story um, that was originally published in Guernica titled Inscape. Um, and I took a look at that story out of curiosity and there are some interested, there are many similarities, but many differences between that story and what's going on in this book. The, the narrator is, uh, has the same name as the narrator in this book, um, but she is in the story, she's a professor of English, not a researcher in neuro neuroscience. So I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what brought you back to circling back to that short story and wanting to make something more different out of it? Sure, of course. Um, first of all, thank you so much um, to the American Library in Paris. Thank you, Alice. Um, thank you, Eula, for being in conversation with me. Um, around the time that I finished a first draft of my first novel, Homegoing, I started working on this short story. Um, at the time, I just kind of wanted to, you know, set Homegoing aside and uh, think about new things so that when I returned to it, I would have fresh eyes. And so in that period, I wrote Inscape, um, which felt so different from... Interesting to me in that is that the that the research set the parameters for the narrative in certain ways. Um, mm. And rather than you had a narrative in your mind and that told you what you needed to research, the research told you this something about the story. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, the process of doing, doing the research. And this book draws on lots of different sources. It draws on your own life experience. It draws on the research of a good friend. Um, but you also mentioned doing this research into neuroscience and, um, and things like that. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I had come off of um, Homegoing, my first novel, which was incredibly research intensive, but of a different kind. I think um, the research for that, uh, as you were saying, Transcendent Kingdom is one that was a book that was kind of directed by the research 
with Homegoing, I kind of, I did know what the story was and the research helped me to kind of fill out the world. Um, in some cases, the research directed the story, but in most cases, um, I knew um, I knew the broad strokes. Um, and because the timeline of that novel was really, really wide, um, I found myself doing research that felt, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, like wide but shallow in that I needed to, to learn a little bit about a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, and for Transcendent Kingdom, um, I, I only needed to know like a couple of things, but I wanted to know, um, know them as, as intimately, as in depth um, as I, a lay person could. And so that process did feel a little bit different. I, I started with the work of my friend, um, and I was very fortunate to have her um, because she read drafts and, and gave me feedback. And um, so that was really helpful. Um, she directed me toward um, pieces that might that might also help uh, fill out um, the novel. Um, I was doing a lot of research into the opioid uh, epidemic, um, which at the time in 2017 uh, was, was being written about, uh, you know, really frequently quite often so it was it was um easier to kind of get information about it every day from from the various newspapers um, mm -hmm. um yeah but it was yeah rather than wide and shallow it was narrow and deep for mm -hmm. for transcendent mm -hmm. kingdom yeah there's one experiment um that that is kind of a refrain in this book that comes back again and again and it's an experiment that involves um mice who have been trained to push a lever for a reward. Um, but then after some time, after they learn to push the lever for a reward, um, they sometimes push the lever and get shocked instead of mm -hmm. getting a reward. Um, and then they always get shocked instead of getting the reward. And, um, and your narrator is, says that she's, she's most interested in the mice. Different mice have different responses to this situation, but she's most interested in the mice that never stop pushing the lever, even after they only get a shock every time. Um, and let's see, it looks like I didn't write down a question about that. I'm just interested <laughs> in it. Um, so I guess my question is, can you, can you talk about your narrator's fascination with that group of mice? <laughs> Sure. Um, so this, this experiment, which I had been calling the lever press experiment, um, uh, is one that is the thesis project of, of my friend, Tina. Um, so I did in fact um, borrow that from her, her life and her work. Um, and what was really interesting about it is that, you know, I don't, I don't think that, you know, what Gifty took out of this is what Tina took out of it, but for Gifty, because she was impacted by addiction on a personal level. Um, her older brother um, passed away from uh, uh, an opioid overdose. Um, I think when she's looking at the mice, what she is seeing, though she protests this constantly throughout the novel, um, what she's seeing is her, her brother, her relationship to her brother. Um, and what we are seeing as, as the reader is, is herself and her own kind of um, relation to reward seeking. And so it was a way to kind of think through all of these family members, her mother as well, as, as the mouse who like won't press the lever, um, even for the reward. Um, and so in that way, like they all became implicated in this experiment that that kind of undergirds this novel. Um, and I, I liked that as a uh, as a way to see all all three of these characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it made me as a reader start to wonder what kind of mouse I was. <laughs> you know, it, it invites that question. Um, yeah, it does. Um, so one of the really unique features of this novel is that uh, many of the central characters are absent characters in various mm -hmm. different ways. So the Gifty's father returns to Ghana. Um, her mother is both present and absent at the same time due to depression and her brother's drug abuse makes him absent as well. And so I wondered if you could just talk about the, the challenges of writing characters that are, that are absent in, in those ways. Yeah, definitely. It is a novel um, in which the absences are, are presences in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, 
as you said, the, the father um, who Gifty only ever refers to as the Chinchin man, he, he leaves physically. So he, he moves back to, to Ghana, but it's his absence um, and this decision that he makes to return to their homeland that kind of um, is the first domino to fall um, because we see the way the, the grief um, of, of going through that uh, starts to affect Nana's life um, and Nana's grief and the way that he deals with that starts to affect uh, Gifty's mother um, and so on and so forth. And so I, I wanted each of these absences um, to feel as present as though the characters were themselves on the page, even when they, even when they weren't physically there. Um, and I think the hardest one to write was was Gifty's mother, um, because um, for those who have read the novel, she spends almost the entirety of the front story in bed um, and, and not speaking. Um, and so what, what it meant was that I had to find a way to like have this character who is essentially inert for much of the novel, like feel as um, alive on the page as, as any of the others. Um, and to do that, I suppose I was thinking about what she meant to Gifty and Gifty's recollections of these times when she wasn't um, when she wasn't incapacitated. The the moments of her childhood when her mother was quite fierce and fearsome, and carrying that um, the light of that, um, I think, was the way to keep her keep her alive, keep her present, even as she as she was in bed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you read this South African novel, um, A Hot, uh, that looks like, the title looks like Agat, um, I think, uh, if I, I can't remember the, the author at the moment, but that novel is so gorgeous, and, but I, and I thought of that novel when I was reading your book, um, because the narrator of that novel, novel has ALS and is um, totally nonverbal and can't move. So there's right. there's a character who is um, really not a typical character in that she can't do or say anything. <laughs> so right. the, so all the action unfolds in her mind. Um, oh, I, I have not heard of that, but um, I absolutely want to read it. It's such an incredible read. Yeah, I just, yeah. that's off my um, series of questions, but I just, mm -hmm. it occurred to me to mention that book. Yeah. Um, back to my questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, your novel explores all these different, I'm not even sure what to call them, I guess approaches to thinking is what I wrote down or approaches to thought, um, a, it, approaches to thinking about mental illness. Um, so some are scientific approaches, some are religious beliefs, um, some are folk traditions. And while science is certainly a dominant element of this book, it isn't presented as the only way of answering a question, um, mm. neither the book itself nor the narrator herself seems to understand science that way. Um, mm. could, you, could you talk about that element of the book? Yeah, um, this is like an obsession of mine, like a personal obsession of mine. So I, I think that's why it wound up in the book. But I grew up um, like Gifty, I grew up uh, in the church. I was raised Pentecostal. Um, and I, uh, you know, even before my family came to America, we were Pentecostal. But then once we arrived, um, we wound up in Alabama where there was um, Pentecostalism still existed, but in, it was practiced in a different way. Um, um, but I mentioned that because something that I became really aware of as I moved away from the church, and I would say I, I left the church when I was in my in my teenage years under very different circumstances than, than Gifty leaves um, in the novel. Um, but I remember going to college, like leaving Alabama, going to uh, going to California for for university um, and seeing and seeing all of the ways that the that the way that I had been taught to think um, did not like did not mesh with the way that other people had been taught to think like there wasn't this like scaffolding of believing or allowing for the possibility of something unreal um, or something to go back to what we were saying before like something physically absent um, to be real in someone's life. Um, and in fact, that, that that way of thinking, um, be it 
if we want to call it, uh, you know, religiosity, if you want to call it spirituality, like any, any kind of belief in things unseen um, mm -hmm. as being, uh, was kind of treated as somehow less than, um, or, you know, kind of at odds with intellectualism. Um, and it, it's so place specific here in the States, I think, because like I grew up in a town where it wasn't unusual to go to the doctor's office and have a Bible next to the, in the waiting room, like with all the magazines. Mm -hmm. um, but any, anywhere else I've lived, like that's not only unusual, but would also um, be like frowned upon. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and so I think that's where I started to see the ways of thinking and to think about the, the, the fact that we all bring in, um, yeah, we all bring to the table these different um, visions of the world and of what's possible in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and because Gifty grows up um, with a mother who's incredibly religious and because she herself was incredibly religious as a, as a child, even when she leaves the church like that, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, like that scaffolding is still there for her. Like she still, um, she can still, draw from it when she needs to, when she wants to, um, even if she no longer believes, like the house is still erect. And so she can't, um, she can't abandon it entirely. And I, I find that really interesting. I think it's probably true of me as well. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that I loved about this narrator is that she, there are other characters in the book that feel conflict between science and religion, but this narrator, doesn't necessarily experience those systems of thought as in conflict. She's she's open to all of it. She's using everything that she yeah. has at her disposal. Um, but one of the really moving aspects of the book it, it, and, and sad aspects is that it seems like um, every system of thought, every approach comes up short when it's faced with the problem of depression and addiction. So that it's, mm -hmm. you know, neither religion nor science nor folk traditions, none, none of these things seem to be able to solve that problem. Mm, yeah, exactly. Like with, at least for, for Gifty, now that she's moved on to science, what she's searching for, um, though she doesn't always articulate it this way, what I think she's searching for is a way to kind of um, make sense of uh, the the illnesses that have affected her family, ad addiction and depression. Um, and her mother comes from a culture um, and is, is of the belief that um, kind of only God can save her, only God can help her. And so she rejects Western medicine um, and in so doing is kind of rejecting the way that Gifty has come to, to think um, and to try to make sense of, of um, her mother's situation. Um, and so there, there's this, this layering that's happening where Gifty like needs the, the spirituality and the, um, the kind of cultural practices because those are the only things that her mother will accept. Um, and yet the science is the thing that's bringing her closer, she thinks, um, to being able to, to answer these questions, to being able to kind of help. Um, but as she says at the end of the book, like nothing, ultimately nothing um, provides everything that she, that she needs, like nothing, um, none of the resources that she has has been able to rouse her mother um, from, from her bed. And so we do see all of the ways that, um, that you know, our tools are inadequate um, when faced with like the reality of of a, a person's mind, um, and I yeah I I find that really fascinating. Yeah. Yes. The, and that problem seemed very real to me. The very of of life as I know it. <laughs> um, yeah. So in this narrative, Gifty is, is saved in the religious sense, um, but she's also, um, she's also hoping to save other people in, in another sense. So she, she hopes to save her mother and her brother and, um, and those, those hopes are frustrated in various ways. Um, and could you could you talk a bit about what it means to be saved in this narrative in the in the context of the book? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when Gifty first experiences salvation, 
Um, it's, it's at her church. Um, and as she describes it later in her adulthood, like it, it was an incredibly, um, like moving experience of all of the, all of the congregation's hands outstretched toward her. And what she feels is like a kind of, um, transference of their energy, their love from their hands to her. Um, and whether or not she's able to think of that moment uh, later on as real, um, that sense of it was was very real. And so, you know, she kind of can't um, discredit the child that she was who believed in that. Um, but the salvation that Gifty becomes interested in, um, her attempts to save later on in her life um, are, uh, is her brother um, whose addiction um, is like so many, uh, so many other people who suffer from addiction is this kind of cyclical thing where he will, uh, you know, get better, relapse, get better, relapse. Um, there's a moment where she says something like all of the work that she does in the lab is an attempt to get to the bottom of something that has no bottom, um, which is to, to find a way to stop this, this cycle um, before the, the stop that happens in Nana's life, um, which is his, his passing. Um, and obviously she, she doesn't do it quick enough and no one has done it quick enough. Like we, um, there are scientists working on this very thing who haven't haven't found you know, a magic pill that's going to answer this. Um, and, and by the end of the novel, I think we're left wondering if, if that's even possible, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but, but it is, it is the salvation that Gifty's interested in. Like how do we turn off whatever that thing in the brain is that makes us want to keep pressing the lever even when we know we shouldn't? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you, I think I'm gonna skip ahead to just one last question for me because I can see that there are many, many questions from the audience. So I'm gonna give one last question for me and then we can turn to the, to the other questions. Um, I, I wanted to circle back around and this is kind of a craft question I, that I'm quite curious to talk with you about. You mentioned that one of the great departures between this work and your first book was working in the in the first person. And this novel is in very close first person, so that the reader feels privy to all the thoughts and feelings of this character, Gifty. Um, and this is interesting to me because, as an essayist, I'm almost always working within the first person, right. you know. And so it, it was interesting to think of of a writer coming kind of anew to the the powers and restrictions of the first person what it what it can and can't do um yeah. so i wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the experience of writing in the first person and, and what it did for you or ways in which you felt constrained by it or or anything at all yes um well i have new admiration for for everyone who works in the first um be it essayists and memoirists or, or people writing fiction in first person because it it is incredibly challenging. Uh, it was for me incredibly challenging, mostly thinking about kind of like questions of like the occasion of a novel, like why, um, why should we be, why would Gifty be telling anyone any of this? Why would she be thinking about any of this? Um, one thing that really helped me um, was to read memoir. Um, so I, I read a, a number of memoirs that I found incredibly helpful um, in, kind of reframing um, how a story might be told. And ultimately I wanted this, um, this novel to feel almost as though you were reading Gifty's memoir. And in that, in that way I could circle around the question of why is this story happening? Um, uh, so it was a kind of way, a way to cheat. Um, the, other, the other difficulty of first for this book was that um, Gifty, herself is an incredibly reticent character. She's not, um, she's not open. Uh, she's not willing to be vulnerable always. Um, she's, she can be dishonest. Um, and so thinking about ways to see around what she was willing to say um, or what she was able to say, kind of where she was in her own emotional state, um, the information she was able to give, that was, that was, the second biggest challenge. And one way that I 
got around that was the uh, the journal entries um, where you get to see her um, in her in her child state where she has that kind of innocence, that vulnerability. She's using these code names because she's still the kind of person who like can't be completely honest, but the code names provide her with an opportunity to tell a truth that she that she wouldn't let herself tell otherwise. Um, I found um, some, some novels really helpful. Um, I was thinking about like a writer, like, or a, a novel like Lolita, um, mm -hmm. where a, a first uh, person um, narrator is lying to you and knows that he's lying to you. Um, or then uh, a book like Gilead um, by mm. Marilyn Robinson, which I adore um, yeah. with like the most earnest narrator, uh, right. John Ames, who uh, he would never lie to you. And if he, if he does, or if he thinks that he was unfair to someone, he comes back and kind of corrects the record. And, um, and that gentleness I knew was not going to be the right thing for Gifty. Um, and so ultimately the, the model that felt closest was um, The Remains of the Day by Ishiguro. Mm -hmm. Which is a phenomenal book, um, and that narrator I I love because he is he is unreliable, um, but he's unreliable because he he doesn't know himself. Um, so he like he he can't reveal things because he hasn't examined um, his own mind enough to um, to question the things that he knows. Um, mm -hmm. And so that felt more closely aligned to where Gifty mm -hmm. was. Like she's not trying to mislead you when she says, you know, I didn't do this work because of my brother. Um, but she's she's misleading you because she can't examine herself or she hasn't yet examined herself. Um, so that was helpful to see other ways that people had employed uh, the first person um, in in fiction. Um, but yeah, it. it it was uh, it was tricky, and I ended up really I ended up really enjoying it. But um, having come off of a, a very pulled back third person mm -hmm. um, with with my first novel, um, I realized like you can do so much more in third, um, especially that pull like you can know everything and see everything and and offer any piece of information that you want to offer, um, and in first person you you can't do that, and you have to really get to know this character in a way that um that you don't necessarily have to like deeply know every single character in a novel written in third person yeah it's so interesting has in the character's own limitations become kind of one of the constraints on the page right that exactly. there's things as you said that this character can't know about herself because she's just not the kind of person who will know that about herself yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, exactly uh, this is all so interesting. I'm going to now um, pass the baton to Alice, who is going to moderate the questions from the audience, of which there are very many already. Um, so for now. Thank you, Yula. <laughs> I want to mute. Hi. Um, hi. Yula, th hi, hi, uh, hi. Thank you, Yula, who's already disappeared. Um, thank you for your wonderful questions and for your time and for preparing um, so thoughtfully. Uh, it's a pleasure to to have you back virtually at the library. Um, yeah, we have received many comments, many questions. I first want to acknowledge um, the international nature of the audience. Truly, uh, people are tuning in from all over the world. Cairo, Rouen in France, Reunion Island, New York, Bordeaux, Paris, Dijon, uh, St. Louis, Cambridge, UK, St. Louis, Missouri, um, New Haven, Connecticut, two from California, three from California. <laughs> so hello to everyone. Thank you for tuning in from whatever um, time period you are in. If you're in a morning mood or an evening mood, it's so wonderful to have you here. Um, we are now moving to the questions and comments part of the evening. Uh, we have 25 minutes, so please go ahead <laughs> and post your question. If you've arrived and you think, what's going on? Um, you're listening uh, to a conversation, but you were listening to a conversation between Yula Biss and Yar Jazzy about Yar's fantastic new novel. This is the French copy, um, Sublime Royaume. In English, it's Transcendent Kingdom. And uh, we can now ask Yar your questions. So your, the first question um, I received was from Robert, and he would like to know more about religion in your life, um, how important 
was it to you that you left uh, Pentecostal Church? And what has the role, what role has the Bible played in your writing? Hmm. Um, it, it's interesting. I mentioned Marilyn Robinson, um, who wrote the, the novel Gilead, um, among many other beautiful novels. She was one of my teachers in graduate school. And I remember um, actually sitting in on one of her Bible studies um, at, at her own church when I was studying there. And the feeling that I had at that time was you know, if I had had someone who approached the Bible and religion like this in my youth, I don't know that I would have left the church. Like, um, it felt so different from the way anyone had ever talked about God to me before. Um, the church that I grew up in, and I should specify, this was an all-white uh, evangelical church in the South. Um, that church was, was incredibly restrictive, um, and as I was, as I was growing up, I realized I was starting to kind of develop a political ideology that didn't, um, that did not align with the things that I was being taught in the church. And so it felt imperative that I leave. Um, I don't think I, I could have become the person I needed to become and, and have stayed, um, in that place. Um, but that said, um, there are other churches and other other ways of thinking. Like I think this book, like one of the questions that Transcendent Kingdom um, kind of asks you is, what would Gifty's life have looked like if she had grown up in a black church, um, if she had grown up in Ghana in in the Pentecostal church there? Um, there's there are other ways of of believing and of thinking than the one that she ends up um, being a part of. Um, and so I wanted to be to be sensitive to that. But as for me in my life, like I think it was um, hugely important um, that I leave. Um, but again, like I spent um, many years there going multiple times a week. Like it doesn't it doesn't leave you entirely. Um, so I'm sure it shows up in my work in in a million ways, not just in in this book, but. Um, likely in everything that I write. And I probably would never be able to fully articulate all the ways that it um, has influenced me. Mm. What struck you about Robinson's approach to religion? Um, there's just um, a kind of generosity, um, not the emphasis on, on the kind of fire and brimstone, <laughs> um, but uh, a feeling of, of generosity. Um, that, that I had not seen before. And I don't know if, if any of you ever get the chance to, to listen to her speak um, about anything, uh, about her work, about anything. Um, she's one of those people who speaks in full paragraphs. Like she just is uh, a pleasure to listen to um, and, a, and a deeply intellectual person. Um, and I, I did grow up, like as Gifty says in the novel, you know, grew up around people who were kind of suspicious of um, intellectualism as though it were going to be used against them, used to kind of trick them out of their faith. Um, and so to have to have Robinson um, and see the ways that it, it can still be compatible with, with faith if you wanted it to be. Um, I don't want it to be, um, but it's, it's nice to, to see that. Yeah. Lovely. Um, I'm just going to hop around a little bit, <laughs> so it might feel that we're, we're pinballing. Um, sure. uh, Michael has a question. Uh, what were the aspects or traits of Gifty or other characters that changed greatly through the course of writing or editing the book? Mm. I don't, it's, that's a great question. It's also a hard one for me to answer because I, I generally don't have a plan when I start writing. Um, and I, I go into each novel and short story, like I go into them kind of completely blind. Um, and for both novels, they are written basically the way that you see them. Um, like I write in the order that, that it appears on the page. Um, and I don't do a lot of like outside sketching or planning. Um, this is all just to say that the characters are are revealed to me in much the same way they are revealed to you, the reader. Like I, I don't know if Gifty changed that dramatically from like a first draft to a last draft, um, 
but rather I feel like as I was writing that first draft, I was getting to know her, um, like starting to kind of listen to her and think of the ways that she, um, as I was saying before, think of the ways that she was maybe hiding from me. Um, and in that way, I feel like she, she's, she turned out to be pretty consistent um, from, from first draft to last draft. I don't know that she changed um, a great deal. Other characters? Other characters. Um, yeah, same for, same for the other characters. I've never, I'm like, a, I'm pretty concise in my writing and generally like the notes I get from, from other people and from, from, you know, agents and editors is that I need to make things um, longer, that I kind of need to add more. Um, but for the most part, like the seed of everyone is, is there and is the same. Like no one in either of my books, like no one has changed so dramatically from, from the first draft to the last draft. Why do, why do you think that's your impulse to, to, to write kind of concisely as opposed to sprawling and then editing, editing? Um, I, I don't know another way to do it. I've never tried, I suppose, certainly not for a novel. I haven't tried to do the kind of slash and burn style of religion or of revision. Um, I, it, like, I feel very stressed just thinking about working like that, but I know many, many writers who like, that's their process. Like you write much more than you need and you whittle it down. Um, but for me, the first draft is so, it's so like, it's so sacred. It's such a special time. And it's where I find out what I'm, what my questions are and what I'm even trying to ask on the page and to, um, to be more maximalist in it, I think would ruin the, the part of it that I like, um, which is that like slow uncovering. Um, so I can't, I can't imagine doing it in a different way. This actually gets to uh, Natasha's question, who wants to know, um, you mentioned some of your preparation for your books, research, reading memoir. Can you describe the moments where you commit to a project and you tell yourself, I'm writing this book. Um, mm. I'm going to see this through. What do those moments of commitment and conviction or exploration look like for you? Sure. Um, well, okay, so for both books, what's happened is that I'll have a lot of false starts. Um, with Homegoing, I think I threw out about 150 pages. Um, with Transcendent Kingdom, I threw out maybe like 30 pages of things that I thought were going to be the novel. Um, sometimes it was the idea that I had, sometimes it was a different idea that was getting me to the novel. Um, and both times what happens is that I will write like maybe 30 pages, 40 pages, um, and then I'll read it and and it will feel almost like recognition. Like I'll, I'll be like, oh, there you are. That's the novel. Like that's what I wanted to be working on. Um, and this is like always the first, the first 30 pages, the first 40 pages. Um, and that's, I guess that's the moment when I commit. But before that, it's not that I'm not committing. It's just that I haven't had that feeling of recognition of, of, um, of knowing like, this is the thing, this is it. Like, it's like a, a key fitting in the lock. Um, like I keep trying the wrong key. And then once I get the one that fits, I, I know that I'm in it and I know that I'll finish it. Like, it doesn't feel like a choice. Like it's, um, when I find the right key, it's like, okay, this, I, I can open the door. I'll be in, I'll be in this house. I'll be in this book. Um, but before that, it's just, uh, just trying. And do you like that process? Do I like the process? The try. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think about the initial process? Um, I hate it. I think it's <laughs> it's terrible. No, I, I I really wish that I wrote differently. I don't know. Um, I'd be curious. I know Eula's off, but I, I'm always curious to hear about how other writers do it. Um, I haven't found a, another way or a way that works better for me, but I, I I know a lot of other writers who don't work that way. Um, I just haven't found a, a better way. That's the one that makes the most sense to me. But it does mean that I spend um, many months, sometimes years, um, working on things that aren't right. 
um, and kind of banging my head against the wall. Um, and that's always frustrating, like when I'm feeling it, but it's, I suppose I should say, it's like ultimately always worth, worth it. Like it never feels, when I finish the novel, it never feels like a waste of time to have spent the beginning doing all of that um, back and forth. But when I'm in that beginning place, it feels terrible. <laughs> right, I love that. Do I like it? Obviously not. <laughs> um, we've had many, many questions uh, about what you're working on now, what you're working on next. Mm. Um, yes, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm at that place that I just described where I'm, uh, I think I know what the novel is um, and I do like what I'm working on, um, but I, I don't know yet if it's, if it's right. Um, I'm also very superstitious, so, um, so I can't say until I know. Um, so all I will say is that I'm working on something um, and, and hoping that it's going to stick, but I don't, I don't know yet. And how does it feel? I'm curious, yeah, you know, this is your third, this would be your third project. How does it feel? You know, you've, the first one is obviously such a kind of step out into the literary world. The second one then inevitably is compared to the first one. Does the third one feel differently to you? Um, it does. I think I, you know, I was, I was very uh, anxious about the, the second novel, um, anxious about whether I would be able to write a, another novel. Like it's, people say this all the time and it's true. Like you, you spend your whole life writing your first novel in some way, like everything goes into that one. And so I, I would go, I would go to the library or go into a bookstore and see people with like multiple books in their names and think, how did, how did you ever, how do you ever do it again? Um, it felt so impossible to me. And so now I feel much better for the third one in that I know at the very least that it's possible to, um, to write something else that I feel um, as deeply about um, as, as I did for, as I did for home going. So um, so in that way, I feel um, more at ease than I did um, between Homegoing and Transcendent Kingdom. We have a question actually about Homegoing. Um, uh, this is from Sanya. She wants to know what inspired you to write it and what was the message you wanted to pass on to your readers? Hmm. Um, well, I started Homegoing when I was in university. Um, and at that time, I had a very different idea in mind. Um, I had gotten this research fellowship uh, that they give to sophomore students to uh, complete a research project uh, between sophomore and junior years. And so I used mine to go to Ghana and write a novel. And at the time I thought, I'll just go to my mother's hometown, which is in the central region of Ghana, um, an area that I hadn't spent very much time in um, and just see if anything came up for me. Um, and what ended up happening is that um, nothing came up. Um, and I was, I was kind of feeling like I was wasting everyone's time and money and faith. And then a friend of mine from, from college came to stay with me. Um, he had never been to Ghana before and, and wanted to go see the Cape Coast castle, um, which I had never been to before. Um, and so we went to the castle with my cousins um, and we took the tour uh, that they give to anyone who, who goes. Um, and it is the only time in my writing life where I have felt anything akin to like a stroke of inspiration. Like it was instantaneous. Like I knew that I wanted to write about that place. Um, it, felt, uh, it felt haunted. Like it, it was a space that felt like it, um, like there was something there, like a story there. Um, and so that was, that was the inspiration. That was the beginning of that book. Uh, I didn't know what form it would take. Like I didn't know how long it would take. I didn't know anything about it, except for that I wanted to somehow uh, grapple with that place. Well, you mentioned superstition. You know, it, it's all, <laughs> it's always a part of this. Um, I mean, how, how do you see those two things as connected? Yeah, no, as it turns out, I'm incredibly superstitious. Um, tell us, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, um, I mean, that before, before that trip um, and before that, that visit to the castle, I don't know if I would have like articulated that feeling um, of 
of haunting. Like, I don't think I'd ever felt that before. Um, but the, the, for those who haven't been like, it's a, it's a beautiful building, um, like magisterial whitewashed on the outside. There are these cannons that face out to sea. There's this church on the top level. Um, and the tour guide, you know, tells you about the day-to-day -day lives of the soldiers who were working there, um, which is how I learned that the, the British soldiers who used to live in the castle would sometimes marry the local women, um, which was something that I hadn't heard before. And yet, as I started to kind of piece together, my mom is Fanti, um, which is uh, the, the ethnic group of that region. As I started to piece together, like some of the last names of Fanti people that I knew, like, um, that our British last names it made sense that there were these um, these marriages that had taken place. And then from there, he took us down to see the, the dungeons. And it was that experience of standing in the dungeons, um, which even all of these centuries later uh, still smell, um, still have grime on the walls like that, that sense of like something lingering was so so apparent to me um, and I, I had not experienced it ever before and I, I haven't experienced it since but um, yeah it just felt like a uh, visceral. It strikes me that that I, yeah, I suppose visceral experience superstition you know you used all these synonyms um, and I wouldn't be the first person to point this out but is at odds with the scientific process mm. and the you know, kind of um, specificity and how clinical that is. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you reconcile those two parts? Yeah, it is, but it also isn't, I feel, and I'm sure there are scientists out there who will hear me say that and like bulk, but um, when I think about um, these conversations that I had with my friend, what becomes clear to me is that so much of, of that kind of science is like trying to see beyond what is possible, like what we can see um, right now, like what is available um, to us to know. Um, and in that way, it feels, it feels like so much of, so many other things that we do. Like it feels like what we do when we, when we write, it feels like what we do when we pray, like all of these things, um, that are trying to get at something that make a shape out of something that doesn't yet have a shape. Um, we have the language for that, even if even if the way we get there is different. Um, that enterprise, like that that goal, feels um, yeah, it feels like a common one, and so it's it it didn't feel strange to me to move from thinking in superstitions to, to thinking in, in kind of scientific reasoning. Um, for Gifty, it's all, it's all meaning making, like it's all trying to make sense out of um, the world that we live in. And we can all relate to that, like lay people and, and scientists alike. Totally. Did you, um, uh, you know, on this point about the kind of the scientific, <laughs> scientific language, did you find it, um, ever a challenge while you were writing, as you say, to kind of translate it into um, language that lay people could kind of understand and relate to and that still was scientifically accurate, you know, and, and did justice to your friend's work, but also, you know, reaches a, a, a wider audience? Mm. Um, I, I did, but also I think I myself am a lay person, so that that was really helpful. Like to to realize that um, um, that as long as as I could understand it, anyone else could understand it. I didn't have the the kind of um, deep, intimate knowledge of the scientific language before I wrote the novel. But I can bring people into that um, because I myself was brought into it, um, and so that that felt like the, the way to approach it was to think of myself as the reader um, and what did I need to know about this work in order to understand it, that would be what, what anybody else needed to know. Um, I think the, the other question that I had, like the other side of that coin was whether um, neuroscientists would read it and feel like it was, <laughs> it was accurate and kind of capturing their, their understanding of things. That felt like the harder task than like making it accessible to, um, to lay people. 
have there been responses from the scientific community? Yeah, there have, and it's been really, it's been really great um, to to hear from people who who work in various sciences. Um, as my friend generously said, like you know, everybody comes to that work for different reasons, and even like neuroscientists are coming from. Uh, different places like some of the acronyms that she uses for her work are still like uh, you know um, acronyms that other other neuroscientists might not know and so that that is is freeing for for me as a writer um, and yeah it's been it's been nice uh, the response has been good Lovely. Well, I'm, um, if anyone else, I, I've been now asking my own questions. <laughs> if anyone else has a final question, I think um, there was one more about, okay, this is from Elizabeth. Um, are you moving away from narratives um, linking Africa and America as in, in home going? Mm. No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, e even though it's not like the front, um, front of mind of Transcendent Kingdom, it's still a, a book that's linking um, African and, and American narratives. Um, I think where I am now in my thought process and in my career is that I'd, I'd like to be at a place where I can just write whatever occurs to me, like whatever, whatever story um, I want to write. I will often, I imagine that I will often write about, um, about West Africans. I will often write about what it feels like to be um, like an other in a, in a new place. Um, those are feelings that I'm interested in. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not explicitly moving away from, from that and just following the stories. And the, and the, and the feeling. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to read out this fantastic comment from uh, Michael, who's in the audience, who asked many questions this evening. He says, I don't know about neuroscientists, but micro, microbiologists love it, at least one. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine <laughs> he's a microbiologist. Thank uh, you. <laughs> hello, Michael. <laughs> and hello to the microbiological community. Uh, <laughs> should, there, should there be any others in the audience? Um, yes. So I'm looking at the clock and um, we're fortunately a little bit out of time. So, um, and before I go, uh, and before you go, and before we get to the long list of thank yous, yes, Yula has <laughs> reappeared. Yula, can you really briefly speak to your writing process since it came up? Yeah, it was so, so interesting to hear about yours, yeah. And I, I know only a handful of writers who work the way you're describing. Um, mm. And w one of them is my partner who I'm married to. And mm. I've always thought that it looked like super excruciating. <laughs> 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 but it results in beautiful work. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, my process involves a lot of what Ya says she doesn't do, which is uh, I, I erase a lot. Um, but I, I guess what is, I, I've got the odd combination of being a writer who writes very compressed work like that's one of my problems as a writer is that my work tends to be too compressed and I have to expand it out so, but even as I'm expanding it out I'm cutting it away so mm. I have this problem of expanding it and then I cut it down and it's tiny again and <laughs> I expand it and then I cut it down and it's tiny and so that for me is what it it, it looks the, the process is this process of contraction and expansion until the work settles at the length where it feels full, feels like it's done all its work. Thank you. <laughs> like an accordion. Yes, like, like an accordion. <laughs> yeah. um, well, listen, Eula, uh, thank you so much. Uh, for your oh, this is such a pleasure. This was just a wonderful, <laughs> wonderfully illuminating conversation. Thank you, Yeah, for sharing all these thoughts. Oh, thank you. The pleasure was all mine.